Great. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to see so many people are attending this very special Alta C webinar, looking at green jobs and blue waters in our ports. My name is Val Zavala, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this discussion today. You may know me, I spent about 30 years at KCT Public Television in Los Angeles as a journalist and news anchor, news executive. I now retired a couple years ago, and I am very, very interested in the environment. Of all the issues I care about, the most, most I think this one is the most essential. We all know, of course, that the port, we're going to look at the port and green jobs today, is one of the biggest economic engines, not just of California, but of the country for that matter. How can that engine run both clean and green? Alta Sea is dedicated to seeing how the ocean economy and sustainability can converge and how a green economy can also create a blue ocean. Today's discussion will focus on investing in zero emissions technology and infrastructure of ports. And we're looking in particular at a bill that has been introduced in the House by our Congresswoman Nanette Diaz Barragan. It proposes making a billion dollars available each year for, I believe, nine years. She can elaborate on this a little later. The money would be invested in clean technology, renewable and green jobs, green, renewable energy and green jobs. We'll learn more about that in a moment. And don't forget that you can ask your questions through the chat mode, and I will be getting to them as soon as possible. But first, let me introduce our panelists. Tim McOsker is CEO of Altacy. He is a lifelong resident of San Pedro and an attorney with more than three decades of experience in leadership in government, regulatory, and land development matters. He served as the chief of staff and chief deputy city attorney for former LA mayor James Hahn. He has served as city attorney to various other Southern California jurisdictions. For the past two and a half years, Tim has served as CEO of Altacy. His deep experience in land development, environmental issues, permitting, municipal law, all that complicated stuff is crucial for the growth of Alta C campus. Tim also serves on the governing boards of nonprofits, including Link Housing, the San Pedro Chamber of Commerce, the Historic Waterfront Business Improvement District, among others. And he's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and UCLA Law School. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much, Val. Also joining us is Professor Jason Scores. Jason is a professor at Middlebury Institute of International Studies up in Monterey. He completed his PhD in Agriculture and Natural Resources Economics at UC Berkeley in 2005 with a focus on environmental economics and policy, international development, and behavioral economics. He now teaches courses in environmental and natural resource economics, as well as ocean, coastal, and behavioral economics. In 2009, he was promoted to the chair of the International Environmental Policy Program and in 2011, he became director of the Center for the Blue Economy. He's consulted for major environmental groups, including the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, Earth Justice, and Oceana. He's the author of What Environmentalists Need to Know About Economics, published in 2010. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very and much. And also with us is, we're very honored to have U.S. Congresswoman Nanette diaz Barragan. Nanette was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives four years ago. She's the first Latina ever to represent California's 44th Congressional District. Her district includes Carson, Compton, Linwood, North Long Beach, Rancho Domingo, San Pedro, Southgate, Watts, Willowbrook, and Wilmington, among others, and of course, the Port of Los Angeles. She was born in Harbor City, just north of San Pedro. She's the youngest of 11 children raised by immigrants from Mexico. Nanette graduated from UCLA and UL, US, US, I'm sorry, USC Law School. She went on to work in the Office of Public Liaison for the Clinton White House and then for the NAACP. Her first elected office was to the Hermosa Beach City Council where she also served as their mayor. She fought powerful oil companies and stopped a proposal to drill 34 oil and water injection wells in Hermosa Beach and out into the Santa Monica Bay. In 2016, she was elected to con Congress. She now serves on the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and the exclusive House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Nanette has fought consistently for communities suffering the effects of poor health from pollution, climate change, and inadequate health care. Thank you so much for being with us, Congresswoman. Now, I mentioned the bill that you um, have introduced. It's called the Climate Smart Ports Act. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that would do and, and why you feel it's so important? Sure. So the Climate Smart Sports Act is a bill that I introduced um, because of pollution that we have. Um, we're surrounded by three freeways and the Port of LA. And so the, while the ports create all these fantastic jobs, 
um, and I'm a supporter of those, we said, how do we invest in the ports and in the communities around here so that we can help clean up the air and the emissions coming from ports? So what it is, it's really um, an incentive for um, the movement toward a clean economy and clean energy. And so it creates a fund. And so it's a fund of a billion dollars a year uh, for 10 years uh, that will help ports make that transition and the availability of grants for them to buy these zero emissions technology. The technology is there, but frankly, it's a cost issue. And so this is an incentive to help uh, these um, help ports around the country, it's not just the Port of LA, to invest and to go green. So the money is a grant? The money is a grant. It's a grant program um, that the federal government will be providing uh, to allow uh, the purchase of uh, technology that is used at the ports. And one of the things that was really important for me uh, when we worked with stakeholders was to make sure that there was a provision that would not allow these dollars to be used for automation. Uh, because here at the port, a huge issue of contention and we wanted to be able to save dollars. So this will, uh, think of it as an infrastructure investment. It's money that will be used to help uh, purchase equipment and um, have a clean infrastructure, which is why it got into our, the House Democrats infrastructure bill that was uh, just passed. But that's important. It's not automation that will displace workers. I saw that in the bill. It's specifically not for that kind of technology. That's great. Right. So it's things like, you know, cargo handling equipment, it's port harbor craft, drainage trucks, and emissions. And that's it. I think that we're trying to get there. That's that's the future. Got it. Tim, what are your thoughts on this and how does this dovetail with what Altus's mission is? Well, I actually first I think it's absolutely terrific and we're really, really, really honored to have the Congress member uh, with us today and we applaud the the bill and the idea of this infrastructure investment and what I'll also call innovation investment in the port, because that's really what what Alta-C is all about, as you know, and we've said it at prior webinars, Alta-C is a nonprofit. We're in partnership with the Port of Los Angeles. And our partnership results in this 50-year lease for 35 acres of land where a big component of what we are doing is we are setting aside about 180,000 square feet of area for business innovation, business incubation, and established businesses that are all in the blue economy, which Jason is going to more eloquently than I discussed in a little bit, all folks in the blue economy. And the idea with the blue economy is to sustainably use and avail ourselves of ocean resources to create economic development and really, really good jobs and improve our lives, all with the eye towards sustaining the ocean and the earth for the future. So what the Congresswoman is doing is going to her colleagues and making available federal dollars that can be invested into the technologies and into the products that businesses like ours will be producing. I can see shore power, Congresswoman, being really, really, mm -hmm. really plugging in mm -hmm. ships. I can also see alternatives to shore power being innovated at our site, just as a couple of examples. So I think it's absolutely terrific for us as Altice to work with the federal government and the local government and private industry to create this whole infrastructure, human infrastructure and intellectual infrastructure of sustaining the planet for the future. I think it's great. Thank you. Jason, you've looked at economics, environment, and ports, and ocean. What are your thoughts uh, on, uh, on greening our ports? And uh, it seems like a big job. Are, are we up to the task? Yeah, so a couple quick points. I first want, really want to applaud the Congresswoman for this bill. I think it's a great piece of legislation, and I hope it, it passes shortly. Uh, a couple quick things just to point out. There's a big climate change piece in this because ports produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. But a key point that I think is often missed is the big part of switching off of fossil fuels is for the air pollution uh, and air quality benefits, right? Is that, you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans die from respiratory illness due to air pollution. And a lot of that in our cities is coming from ports. And as I'm sure the Congresswoman, you know, is aware, it's also our, our often our poorest and you know, disadvantaged communities that are bearing the brunt of this. So this is a real environmental justice issue. 
and you're in the perfect place to do this, right? The port of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach have been the big innovators in, in ports in the nation. They've already electrified a lot. And so to extend that to a national program and give these grants, I think is absolutely the right way to go. And not only can we do it, but we should do it, you know, ASAP. Um, Congresswoman, one of the aspects of the bill I was reading deals a lot with job creation. And in particular, it zeroes in on certain groups of people that would ideally be given a leg up on this, you know, those um, who have like, I think vets and other groups. Can you elaborate on that, on the job creation aspect of your bill? Yeah, you know, let me just first elaborate on something that Jason said. Um, one of the reasons that uh, how this bill came about was right here in this congressional district, it has some of those heavily polluted um, air the congressional district in that we have been hearing a lot and seeing firsthand the impact it has had in the local community. Um, sometimes if you're in Wilmington, for example, you'll see kids at the parks. Some some of them have inhalers around their neck because there's so much asthma that is uh, a result of air pollutant for us to make sure we had everybody at the table. And so when we came to drafting this bill, we reached out to labor, we reached out to ILWU, we reached out to the ports, we reached out to environmental justice groups to make sure all the stakeholders had an input. And that's how we were able to build a big coalition to get behind it and to get it moved. And so in this situation, we have provisions in the bill that will provide an incentive to hire locally uh, because we want to create the jobs here. So as much as we can hire locally, um, that's one of the provisions in the bill. Um, there are, it's, it's also uh, meant to uh, create uh, clean jobs, whether it's for the microgrids, whether it's for the technology, and so uh, that's the, the, the bulk of, of where we want to see the dollars are going. Really, it's a local, um, it's a, really a local spin that we want to see because we want the dollars to go here. Now, we happen to be a district that's very diverse. It's almost 90% Latino, African-American. We have a number of veterans here. And so we're hoping those jobs are going to go to, to those right here in our backyard. Um, Tim, how does um, LTC, how do you interface with the Congresswoman in terms of moving this bill forward? Because she, she's got this nice diverse coalition. I assume LTC is part of that. Um, mm -hmm. I, are you allowed to get involved in political uh, legislation? Uh, legislation well, and policy? well, we're a, a 501c3, and so we, we follow all of those rules. But, it, but our mission, our mission is to, uh, to advance uh, the blue economy. So our missions are really aligned here. To advance a blue economy, our mission is to is to build both a sustainable earth and an equitable earth. I mean, our, our diversity commitment is, uh, is like uh, the Congresswoman's and like Jason's is, is we're really, really, really committed to uh, equity and fairness. And here in, in, at Alta C at the Port of Los Angeles, we are ringed by um, uh, census districts that have high poverty and have and have a uh, real need for opportunity and so the harbor harbor this harbor like many harbors around the world uh, uh, ironically create this vast wealth that runs through the shipping lines but it's very often uh, surrounded by folks that are not participating fully in those opportunities so our commitment at Alta Sea is to create jobs at our site, ongoing jobs at our site. And I think also one of the pieces that we're going to be talking about probably today is that we also need workforce development because we're talking about new jobs of the future. And these new jobs in the blue economy are going to require new skills. And so our partnership with, with the Congresswoman is extraordinarily important. And we also, our partnerships with the community college system and with the local high schools and with the school district and the, and the other NGOs who are developing our youth is, are ex also extraordinarily important. Um, Congressman, and, and sorry, I'm, uh, yes, go right ahead. If I may, I, I want to just take a moment to recognize the incredible work that Alta C is undertaking, you know, right here in my backyard at the port by building a campus that's going to bring together the scientists, the educators, policymakers, 
and entrepreneurs to create new jobs and industries in emerging ocean economy, right? It's the vision of Altice for a more sustainable and equitable world that's inspiring. And I'm, in, I'm fortunate to not just have Altice in my congressional district, uh, but really in my hometown. And so I'm really looking forward to working with Altice um, in the innovative ideas that will come out of this and projects that the campus is going to be leading. And so uh, at the heart of having that at the port um, is really, I think, going to make a critical difference and will help me as a legislator be able to go back to my committee, Energy and Commerce, that does everything environment, to bring the ideas and the concepts there to say, how do we get this done? How do we carry it out? And how can we partner with the federal government to make it a reality. And so the Climate Smarts fit with that mission of what all is doing. And it's just the start. I believe that this economic engine, which is the, the blue economy. Mm -hmm. I think we're having a little trouble with your bandwidth, uh, Nanette, because the because you've been uh, stopping and starting a bit. We got most of what you said, fortunately, but I think at the moment your bandwidth is low. So hopefully it will, it will improve a little bit. In the meantime, Jason, can you elaborate mm -hmm. on what the congressman was saying and, and how does your institute, um, how did you get involved in this in the first place, and then what will you contribute to there to the cause? Yeah, sure. Yeah, first of all, I want to second the congresswoman's point about all to see. I, I really was excited to learn about this. And one of the people who's on uh, my board of my organization works with all to see. And, and it's just an amazing thing. I can't wait till the pandemic eases and I can go visit and, and see it in person. Uh, but, but coming back to the larger blue economy, you know, at the Center for the Blue Economy in, in Monterey, we really study all the ways to make ocean industry sustainable and all the economic benefits that come from that. And we really see as we were seeing the Democrats get very, very serious about climate. And we're really pushing for ocean and blue economy components of that, which weren't in the original conception. So a couple of years ago, when the Democrats started talking about this, there was very little mention of the oceans. But our organization and a number of others have really been pushing. And we're really happy to see, like the Congresswoman's bill and other bills, that the Democrats are really starting to see that the ocean is going to be a huge engine for both climate solutions, but also because the impacts of climate change are pronounced in coastal areas, it's going to be really where a lot of the innovation and adaptation comes in. And I'm sure Alto C is going to be at the forefront of a lot of that work as well. Right. Yeah, Tim, you've got, you're a, an expert in partnerships. I guess it seems like you couldn't do it without these partnerships and, and the specific skills and expertise that each one of them bring to the, to the cause. That's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the truest thing you said is we couldn't do it without partnerships. And we're really, really all about uh, creating a, a web or a network of, of partners to be able to do all of this uh, together. In the, in the beginning and the end, what Altice is is a convener. We're a partner with the Port of Los Angeles, obviously, who's you know, deeply committed to this. We're a partner with, uh, with our Congresswoman. And we have this great partnership with Jason and his institute. We've also been fortunate to sign a partnership just recently with UC San Diego to do uh, to, with the Scripps, which is one of the finest institutes in the, in the world, uh, to do sharing of information and of research and sharing of opportunity at their site and at our site. We have a, a equally, we have a partnership with um, Oregon State University uh, through just as Jason identified. This is all about people. Um, having relationships with people across regions and across industries. And uh, our goal is to bring everybody together. And one of the things that we say in our, in our um, uh, staff meetings is that we want to be the world's greatest water cooler. We want to be a water cooler for the future of this planet and certainly a water cooler for the road to the future of this planet is through a sustainable, just, equitable ocean. Got it. Um, Congresswoman, what, I, I see that you have a lot of people have signed on to this bill. What are the next steps and what are the, uh, what are the chances you think of getting the kind of support it takes to get passed? Because you've got, I think, at least a dozen other co-sponsors? Right. Well, we have a number of members. We have a huge coalition. Uh, locally, I'm really proud to have everybody from ILWU to Indivisible San Pedro 
Uh, we also have the Harbor Association of Industry and Commerce, uh, the San Pedro and Peninsula Homeowners. It's a Green for All Alliance. It's pretty big. Now, what happened with this bill was kind of rare, actually. Um, generally, a member of Congress will introduce a bill and lots of bills get introduced and many of them sit there for a while. You know, you got to really lobby just to get a hearing on it. And it takes a lot of time and work to get the bill even onto the House floor for any kind of a vote. Um, but in this instance, we were able to get the bill introduced. And because um, between my staff and I, and, and frankly, uh, most of this is, is staff work, um, that was able to build these coalitions and work with so many stakeholders that got support behind the bill, we were able to go to Speaker Pelosi and say, look, we're talking about an infrastructure bill. And you can't have an infrastructure bill unless you include the ports. And there's a demand right now for environmental justice with the systematic racism across the country. And so uh, I basically made the case that there really wasn't a lot in an infrastructure bill that related to ports and the ports needed a voice. They had to be included. And to remind, um, to remind everybody that uh, there, the, the ports are great job creators and they're huge economic engines but they're also polluters, and so that um, we had to get this done. As a result of that, uh, Speaker Pelosi actually put our bill into the infrastructure package. So it has already gotten out of the House of, mm. of, the House of Representatives, and it has passed. It's now in the hands of the Senate. And so Senator um, Merkley from Oregon has introduced it in the Senate and is trying to get it moved there. And frankly, the way this is going to work is, is when the administration or the Senate Republicans come to the table on an infrastructure bill is where we really need it. Um, we really need it to get pushed. So uh, we're also asking that the Committee for Energy and Commerce that I sit on help elevate it and have a hearing on it. Again, this, it was rare because usually there's a hearing in committee and then it goes to a vote. In this situation, given COVID and everything that's been happening and the move for an infrastructure bill, we were able to get it included in an infrastructure bill already and passed out of the house. So it's pretty remarkable that that, right. that has been able to happen. And, and let me say one more thing is let's say that we don't get an infrastructure bill done this year. And I'm hopeful that, that we can try to push and, and get something done, but there's not that many days left in the legislative session um, until elections hit. This is a framework of what we need to see. There's gotta be more that's put into an infrastructure bill. Don't get me wrong. But this is the starting framework in saying, hey, we can't leave out the ports um, and we've got to make sure we tie this to the blue ocean economy. And, and as Jason said, moving away from the, uh, the fossil fuel investments, which, which has got to be clean energy, clean investments in microgrids. Well, that is fantastic news. I did not realize it was in, uh, enveloped inside the infrastructure bill. That's an incredible boost. That's fantastic. Um, someone asked about uh, greening our ports, and in particular, and I remember this story a while ago, I think it was the Port of LA, um, converted all its um, small trucks and uh, to green energy, you know, the forklifts, all the smaller vehicles that move, that move cargo and so forth, were converted to electric, I think. I'm not sure. Maybe it was diesel. Um, so someone asked, "How? What about the the, the efforts already to green the port?" If I, if I could those? speak to that for just one second, as the and and um, I'm sure the congresswoman would add to this. Great. Uh, I want to speak for my partner, the Port of Los Angeles. You know, we are a nonprofit in partnership with the port. The Port of Los Angeles and the and the combined ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, I think, are on the forefront of this issue and have done some of the best work around the world, certainly the best work in the country for um, the plug-in ships, which you know, to date still only applies to some of the ships, but to the biggest, to the biggest polluters. And, and, and we can go farther and we can plug in more ships in the future. And it has, the port has been on the forefront of looking to its tenants. And I think in a piece by piece fashion, they can speak for themselves, but I think piece by piece, what they have been doing is requiring folks to take these yard hustlers and these yard equipment and turn them over to electric or zero emission equipment. And I think what happens in Los Angeles and what happens in Long Beach becomes a standard for the country and can become a standard for the world, which is why it's so important that our, our Congress member here has introduced this bill and is continues to put 
this region on the forefront of this important issue. And I want to remind people, by all means, we're taking your questions. You can ask them through the Q&A function, and they will get to me the attack. Thank you, Tim. And I'll just... Go ahead. I just wanted to add to a Tim, absolutely right. And the, the Port of LA has been at the forefront of greening the ports. Um, but most of the technology uh, is still not zero emissions. They're cleaner. Um, they may be fewer emissions, but not zero emissions. So the goal for us was how do we get to meet the zero emissions? Right. Um, and one of the goals that uh, is actually in place right now at the ports is to replace hundreds of pieces of cargo handling equipment with zero emissions technology by 2030. Another is to replace 100% of the drayage trucks carrying cargo to and from the ports with zero um, emissions vehicles by 2035. And so this provides an incentive and makes it easier to get there. One of the things I want to mention is, is you know, the port and the surrounding neighborhood here is one thing too. But but then there are communities between the ports and where these trucks are coming from. And those could be inland. And then you have communities going through, you've got the 710 freeway, which is probably the biggest one. And these communities are getting the, 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 the terrible air pollution. So this will help invest in, um, in green of vehicles too, that's gonna have an overall impact. Um, about 40% of Americans live within a few miles of a port. So I think it's a great investment. Um, and it's just the start, we, gotta, we have to do more. Great. Uh, this message or this question is for Jason. It's from Rachel. She says, hello everyone. I have several high school students viewing this webinar. Um, Dr. Scores, what are some areas of study that young people can pursue if they're interested in becoming part of the blue economy? Also, what are some entry level positions that young people can be part of that can be part of? That's it. Opportunities for young people. What should yeah. they study? And what kind of opportunities yeah. are there so we have some high school yeah, kids great. watching fantastic yeah that's awesome um I, to be honest almost all of the major disciplines that you would think about have a blue economy angle right whether it's engineering chemistry biology ecology economics so the key is really finding institutions that have people that are focused on ocean you know work and obviously california we're very blessed we have again we have scripts we have UCLA, we have UC Santa Barbara, UC Santa Cruz, we have my school. So we were really a, a kind of a, a plethora of, of abundance of riches for education. In terms of entry level positions, you know, first of all, you know, Tim's right here. They should pitch the, send their CV to him, get a job at uh, Alta C. Um, but, uh, but in terms of entry level positions, I think one thing we're really pushing for is new kind of coastal restoration. And there's going to be a huge, huge new industry in coastal restoration, living shorelines and rebuilding dune structures and mangroves and wetlands. And this is going to be amazing jobs. And um, if anyone's interested, you know, they can email me after this and I can uh, give them some tips on where they might be able to get involved in that. Great. Good. And your e we'll, we'll get make sure people have your email. Um, another question. Before I you, am one. Before you go to that, can I give a can I just oh, give a shout out to, right to Rachel, to Rachel right. Bronke, uh, who's, who uh, is so great about bringing her kids to, to the site in, in, in healthier times and, and, and online, and she's such a great asset in this community. Uh, to, to take the bait on, um, on Altacy, one of the things that's going to be extraordinarily important to us is establishing these workforce development programs. And so we think, for example, that one of the great one of the great emerging industries here in Southern California out of Alta Sea is going to be aquaculture, uh, ocean farming in a sustainable way. And so we're working, for example, with one of our prospective tenants on a certification program uh, so that we can actually have standards that will meet all of the health and safety requirements, uh, both for the worker and for the product, um, and come up with a way where folks could go right into an industry, could learn and get certified and go into an interest industry which is really small in the United States right now, but important. And that's farming the ocean in a sustainable way, whether it's with bivalves like mussels or uh, seaweeds that can go into food or into healthy product. So I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to, to take the bait and say that Alta Sea is going to be working with our local kids to make sure that we have great jobs for the future. Great. 
Uh, Mary asks, does the bill, this would be a question for um, Nanette. Mary says, what, uh, excuse me, does the bill provide construction funding? What year's budget will it be available? 2021, question mark. And how and when, when and how much are the bill's construction goals to be funded? And who is the bill's administrator at the federal level? A lot of questions there. Did you get all those, Nanette, or would you like me to read? Um, uh, so generally, I think I got them, and if I miss anything, you can um, you can re-ask it. Um, number one, this would create fun, uh, construction jobs because um, you're going to have to build the infrastructure um, to make sure that we have uh, the infrastructure in place. So the funding that's going to be available will be also for port electrification and microgrids. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the things that we have in the bill is uh, the requirement of a prevailing local wage, a prevailing a local prevailing wage in it, uh, so that we uh, make sure the dollars that are paid are at least the prevailing wage. Um, I can't tell you when the funding will go into effect because the bill first has to pass. Um, we have to get it out of the Senate. It's passed the House, but it's got to get out of the Senate, and then the president's got to sign it into law, even if it's a, a part of a bigger infrastructure bill. So it will be available, um, presumably, if it were to pass this year, would be available in the next year. So um, we got to first get it through the hurdle of, of getting it through um, and signed into law. That's the first thing. Um, the rest of it's unclear. Uh, the EPA will be helping administering it. That's that's the, the goal of how it's it's going to run right now and uh, we won't know how they're going to do that until the bill gets passed and the EPA uh, takes a, a look at how how they're going to dole out the dollars but I'll tell you one thing is that we need to make sure that when the bill passes that we work very closely with the port um, and those who apply for grants to write letters of support and to get that those dollars right here because we already have an issue that our port produces more dollars and we don't get our fair share. And so we have to make sure to also do that once this uh, legislation gets through. Okay, got it. Ooh, now we have a lot, a lot of questions coming fast and furious here. Um, this one actually is, is, doesn't deal directly with uh, port technology, but it says, it's an interesting question. I'm wondering how about the thoughts the panel has when it comes to ocean ships working to change fuel to be better for the earth. Do you think the boat technology is moving fast enough? A little bit off topic, but an interesting question. Uh, maybe Jason can handle that. You know about boat fuel? Sure. So for people who don't know, you know, boat fuel is right now is the dirtiest of all fuels. It's even dirtier than airplane fuel, jet fuel. It is really like, you know, it's the dregs from the bottom of the barrel because most of it's burned out at sea. And so people don't, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Obviously that changes when they come to port and that's why a lot of cities, the biggest source of pollution is both the, the boats and then the trucks that are idling at the ports and hence the Congresswoman's bill, you know, would address at least that latter part. The, there isn't enough going on right now on boats. There is some movement. The International Maritime Organization, the IMO, is doing a lot. There's some big organizations in California and the United States uh, that are working on what's called the clean cargo initiative and so that's again increasing fuel standards but this is a pretty tough job some of it will come from more efficient hulls and so the, the ships are just more streamlined and they don't need as much fuel some of it will come from hybrid technologies there's also some hydrogen fuel cell technologies there's potentially some cleaner fuels some biofuels so there's a lot on the table right now but it's a real big priority because if we're going to get climate change under control and really, you know, get this technology uh, up and running in the next decade or two, it's going to need some R&D funding. And so we're calling for more federal R&D funding into these, you know, alternative uh, fuel efficient systems for, for ships. That's interesting. I did not realize that about ship fuel. A question for Nanette. You mentioned the diverse coalition of organizations and groups supporting it. How important is it for these kinds of legislative initiatives to make sure there's support from both business and environmental community? There's a huge gap between those two communities. Right. So um, I'm going to write this down because I, I, I want to first uh, just say a little something about the last question before I go into this one. Sure. Um, I think this is where Altice and the work that Altice is doing could be a huge and impactful 
um, in, in the issue that was just raised about the fuel, right? So to give you an example of maybe how Alta-C is going to help um, on the shipping industry, and this is to maybe look into source of core pollution where current technology limits some of those options. So like the large ships, which carry uh, thousands of tons of cargo to and from the ports, don't yet have a zero emissions alternative available when they aren't plugged in to shore power at the port. So it will take research and development to explore solutions, such as the production of ships that run off zero emission hydrogen. Um, it will take infrastructure investments at the port to ensure this hydrogen is available at our coast and produced in a sustainable way. And so um, that question I thought was a great example just to show at what Altice, you know, the tie that Altice has on how to get there and to the, the research and the development of the, how do we have this ocean economy and, and have it be clean. And so, so I just wanted to point that out because I think that actually makes the case on the work that Altice will be doing in helping explore and doing research and development. Um, on the issue of the coalitions, um, it's uh, it's so critical. In my understanding of the question is the importance of the coalition between uh, business. Is that right? Could just want to make sure I have the yeah, between business and the environmental community. Okay, so um, oftentimes um, there is a false choice. We hear it all, all the time. I'm People say, oh, well, if you're for the environment, you're not for business. Um, if you're for the environment, uh, then that means that you're not for jobs. And that's a false, that's a false narrative. It's not a choice, um, which is why when we uh, were drafting this bill, we wanted to take the incentive approach as opposed as the incentive approach of, of a carrot, not a stick. And how do we get more businesses to want to produce of this technology and mass produce it so it's more affordable. And so that's where uh, getting together with labor, getting together with stakeholders um, was important to do, uh, which is why I'm really proud of the bill and the coalition that was built so that we can have uh, not just uh, the environmental community say they're for it, but we want you know the labor community say for it and we want the business community say they're for it. And when we have those types of solutions, we all win. Right. Great. Uh, kind of a follow-up question to this. Somebody on hell is asking, what are some things that communities can do in order to make this change happen more quickly or be more effective? What can communities do? On the bill or just generally on the environment? I think uh, both the bill and probably in just the effort to green our ports. But the impression I got is to make this change happen. So it could be the bill or the general greening of our ports. I will say as a, as a resident, if I may, uh, Congresswoman, as a, mm -hmm. as a resident of one of these communities, born and raised in San Pedro, and um, like, like my father and mother lived here my whole life, I think it's really extraordinarily important for us to embrace what the Congresswoman just said, that you know, w w we don't have to choose between whether we wanna keep in our community really, really great jobs and the environment. We can be for both. I mean, when we when when uh, when we support uh, the women and men of the ILWU, our longshore workers, we're supporting them in their jobs. But we also want to support their health when they're on the waterfront. We want to make sure that when those ships are approaching, that they're using zero zero or low uh, emission fuels. We want to make sure when they're when they get to the port that they're plugged in. And I think we want to make the commitment as a as a local community whether we're the Chamber of Commerce or the local Sierra Club, that the commitment here is that what we want is a healthy, sustainable community where you know, the great jobs out on the waterfront exist and also the really, really uh, good jobs that are uh, you know, hotel and restaurant workers and other folks that want to live in a healthy environment. And so I think as a community, we need to embrace what the Congresswoman just said. We don't have to choose between the two. We don't have to fight between the environment and economic development. Jason, you wrote that book that had the interesting title, What, uh, what Economists Should Know About the Environment? What, environment. Or what, is, it was, yeah, what Environmentalists Need to Know About Economics. So you dealt with this bifurcation all the time, perhaps quite a, a false one, as the Congressman was saying. Yes. 
Yeah, so this, I'm really glad this has come up because this dichotomy is completely false and it's promulgated by the fossil fuel industry and the toxic you know, emissions industries, right? They want that narrative, right? The, the reality is it's the exact opposite, right? The 21st century, if we could fast forward the end of the 21st century, what the most powerful nations are gonna look like. They're gonna be the ones that mastered clean energy, that mastered climate change adaptation, that mastered biotechnology, right? They're not gonna be the ones that are digging coal out of the ground, right? Those are the 18th century technologies. And it's really important for people to realize is that there's more jobs now in solar and wind than there are in fossil fuels, right? Again, this is just a lie that's promulgated by these industries. They want you to, you know, they want to poison us and keep back our economic development because they make a lot of money off of digging things out of the ground. But it's really a false choice. The, the, the last point I'll make in terms of the community involvement, I think the most important thing for people to do at the community level is to elect good leaders, whether it's city council, mayors, county supervisors, and outstanding congresswomen like we have here with us today. That is, you know, that's our collective future is our elected representatives. And so, especially the young people here are on this, get involved with politics, take it really seriously, because this is how we make collective decisions. And if you want your community to be better, it has to have progressive people with vision. Got it. Uh, this question I skipped because we kind of got into this topic, but Tim, it's really for you. It says, what is the estimated completion date of the research center? I think they mean the all Institute. And when will Altaseed be ready for startup occupancy? Oh, fantastic. So in phase one, we have three projects in phase one. And the first project in phase one is the business, the, the business center, that 180,000 square feet of, of business innovation. It's actually available for interim use right now. We have several tenants that are operating out of there now. Now we have to do a renovation that will take about one year. And we are very, very close to being able to commence that year of renovation. So we are saying late next year, we think the business center will be, will be uh, substantially open uh, because we are looking at the, the pieces that we will build first and we're working on our leases now with tenants who are going to require certain specifications. So about a year on that. Now the science center, and Annette uh, was talking a little bit about the importance of that, that research um, and new discoveries in the ocean economy. That science center is the warehouse that is to the north of the property. It's 45,000 square feet right now. We have schematic plans to make it a 60,000 square foot warehouse, our, our research center. And we, have, we are in negotiations on the development of that site that will be the home to the Southern California Marine Institute, a, a number of universities and campuses here in Southern California. And we are estimating that late 2023 is when that will be open. And then the third phase, the third project in phase one, excuse me, the third project in phase one will be the engagement center, the first point of entry. And we're looking at 2025 for that facility. Great. Uh, for Mary again, this interesting question. I don't know if this is possible. Could the port restrict shipping that is not environmentally clean or acceptable? standards imposed gradually perhaps or maybe incentive programs that benefit shippers who meet new cleaner standards hmm that's interesting how much power does it have a port does a port have to say who can come in who can't come on come depending on their environmental score so to speak as a as a former city attorney here in los angeles uh, can i hazard a, a comment on this yeah <laughs> interesting <laughs> question i don't know <laughs> yeah um, I'm not a city attorney now, but I used to play one on TV. Um, <laughs> so the, the Port of Los Angeles, even though it's a governmental agency, it's something called a proprietary agency. So it operates very much like a government, even though, I mean, excuse me, like a business, and it has some business principles, but it is owned by all of us, by the state of California and by the, the city of Los Angeles. And this is, this port government doesn't operate terminals. What it does is it acts as a landlord and a regulator. And so there is a lot the port can do to require cleaner practices and safer practices. And there's a lot that the port has done. Um, but what the only thing the port can require, I shouldn't say that as this is more of a, this is more of a, of a, an opinion statement, but the only thing that the port as a governmental agency and as a regular regulatory agency can require, is stuff that already exists, technology that already exists. 
And so the tension for the port is to keep pushing that ball forward. And we should all demand that they keep pushing that ball forward and requiring cleaner and greener and safer. But we can't legislate the existence of, of a technology that has not yet been developed. Because if we legislate a technology that has not yet been developed and require a tenant that you can't operate unless you have that technology, guess what? Those jobs will go to Long Beach or to Oakland or to some other part of the world. And so the tension, the cat and mouse game, I'll call it that, is that we want to keep pushing the ball forward and make sure we retain the business because while we retain the business here, we retain jobs and the ability to clean and green this worldwide industry. Right. Um, question for the Congresswoman. Um, is there enough money to go around to all the ports? I think there's a, it's a fair amount of money. It's one billion, you said, for 10 years, each year for 10 years. Um, but what kind of need is it out it is out there? Would this be enough to really make a difference? Or I'm not even sure how many ports there are, but I'm sure there's a lot. So the reality is that we can always use more funding for ports across the country. Um, the one of the objectives here is the that we have the ports included in an infrastructure bill, and we need to start. Um, investing in the green economy and m going green. And so um, I think this is a good start. Um, don't get me wrong. I want to see more dollars uh, into uh, supporting this effort. Uh, but we we just, we need to start somewhere. And I think this is a great start. And, and getting it through the finish line is the first, is the first thing we, we really have to do. Once we do that, we can start increasing the amounts um, that we're going to be putting into it. But uh, I think this is going to make a, a huge impact. Uh, and hopefully the ports across the country will see this as an incentive to help them move quicker to um, reducing the, the greenhouse gas emissions and the pollution. Also, someone asked earlier, and I'm sorry I couldn't get to it, about how do, what role do unions play and um, in this whole investment into ports, um, is it union re union employees? Are the ports required to hire union employees, or what? How does that work? Well, there's a there is if I if I may in the in the the bill in the congresswoman's bill there is a uh, requirement for pro what are called project labor agreements. I think I think there are, and if I misspeak, I apologize. Uh, and project yes. labor agreements mm -hmm. are wall to wall labor agreements for construction, and which is something that this community, this is a union town, this community is very, very, very supportive of. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that when you're doing significant work in a port, like driving pilings into the, into the, into the uh, you know, through the water and into the ground and building, uh, building warehouses and building docks, you want union labor, you want high quality labor because there's a lot at stake. And so the, the, the role of union construction particularly is extraordinarily important to the um, infrastructure development of the port. Great. Um, this question I think is for Jason. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, here it is. It said the US military is, I can't see it all, is a huge polluter globally. Does the bill include any provisions that affect the military? I read through the bill quickly. It didn't look like it did. It dealt with ports, which are not military. But um, but is that right? According to this comment, the military is one of the larger polluters. Jason, what's your what's your knowledge of that? Well, uh, yeah. In terms of the you know the bill, I'll let the congresswoman speak to that. But in terms of the military, the military is very interesting in the sense it's obviously has a huge global footprint um, and huge fossil fuel use, huge emissions but actually quite progressive in a lot of ways. There's a lot of green development going in, the climate change scenarios that the military are doing are, are quite you know, scientifically advanced. So the military, I would say, is really going in the right direction. They just need leadership from Congress. And unfortunately, under the last few years, they've just gotten a blank check to just kind of you know, do new weapon system after new we weapon system instead of smart investments to green their infrastructure and they, you know, they, but I think that you have, there's a willing partner in the military if the leadership is there. Hmm. Your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, just to chime in, the military is not covered in the bill. Um, again, this is a, a bill when it was, was, we, we, 
was drafted uh, to include stakeholders at the port um, and really incentivizing um, some of the uh, goals that the port has now to, to go clean. So it's not included in this bill. Got it. Uh, let's see, we'd love to also ask, you know, uh, Jason, I wanted to um, ask you to elaborate on the essence of your book. What, uh, what are a few of the other things that account that environmentalists need to understand about the economy and maybe vice versa as well um, that would apply to ports? Sure. Well, I'll say, I'll just say maybe one general point that I think is lost. You hear a lot of people in America talking about the free market. Environmentalists want to interrupt the free market. They have it exactly backwards. The free market only works when people pay the damages that they cause. So every coal plant, every fossil fuel plant that is spewing pollution, that is literally killing American citizens and causing climate change, and they're doing it for free. That would be like if I crashed into your house and said, hey, I just destroyed your house, but you know, hey, sorry, your house was in the way, I'm gonna keep driving on. That's what coal companies are doing and what fossil fuel companies are doing every day. And so once you understand that for the market to work, the true costs of things have to be incorporated, then you realize that they're getting, they're basically cheating the system. All of these toxic polluters are cheating the system. And there's a lot of powerful interest to allow them to cheat the system. And I think that's, the, that's probably the most key thing is the market would work great if people actually had to pay for the damages they did. So if you're a chemical plant and you're poisoning the river, you got to pay for that damage. You got to clean it up. And then that would incentivize all the clean stuff because you would want to do the clean stuff. Now, the Congresswoman's bill is a good way to do that. If we're not going to make fossil fuel companies pay the true cost, we can at least incentivize the green stuff. And so there's kind of the carrot or the stick way. But I think the Congresswoman's uh, bill is, is outstanding because unfortunately, there's not the political will yet to take polluters on in, in the serious way that we need to more uh, you know, at the federal level. And if I could just add yeah. to Jason's excellent answer, is the federal government is giving $15 billion a year in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. So this is not a free market. That's all. Got it. So, so when, they, when they talk about the free market, the first thing you have to say, yeah, if there really was one, <laughs> so exactly. They're they're uh, benefiting now. So well, that's kind of where it's a little off top. That's kind of where like a, the idea of a carbon tax come would come in and all the kind of actually having them pay the true costs. So that's a, another uh, another topic. Um, Ezra, we have a few minutes left here. I'd love to give you all some uh, time for some final thoughts and some um, you know hopes for both what happens at our ports and what happens with the bill and what happens in Washington. Whatever you would like to. Uh, discuss as we look forward um, to what we what I think would be an, an amazing uh, transition at our ports because it's again it's not just the ports it's not just the actual infrastructure it's the people who live nearby who are paying the price and don't deserve to pay that price so final thoughts on, on anything you'd like to, to address we'll start with we'll start with Tim we'll go Tim Jason and then the congressman perfect perfect um, I want to go back to, to something that the Congresswoman alluded to that I didn't have a chance really to speak much about, and that's the, um, uh, the importance of research and development and the unique role that, that Altice can play in research and development and you know, scientific endeavors at our site and literally across the plaza from our, our science building will be this business incubation acceleration uh, building so that, so that folks like Jason can take their ideas that they're researching from the research bench and set up a company. You know, a professor or a, a grad student can set up a company just across the plaza and get, and we can, we can capture that technical transfer right here in the port of Los Angeles that is so extraordinarily important where we do research that will catalyze business and business will push research. And our idea is that the all of it will engage the community and our community is not just a local community, it's a regional community and it's a worldwide community. So for the sake of community and for the sake of research and for the sake of business, I think our job is to make sure that when the Congresswoman's bill passes, that we figure out ways to capture that billion dollars a year right here 
We're going to come up with all kinds of great ideas for how to further electrify our port, to how to um, uh, uh, introduce technologies around robotics that will help us with sustainable ocean farming, all of which can help green the ocean and clean the air. So we're really, really, really excited uh, to be able to work with researchers and, and, and business folks and public officials like uh, Nanette Berga. That's right. And there will be many ports. We don't care about competing the, for the care. money in these classes. And we've got to get in there with good ideas and be ready to be ready to, to launch them. And I should say that I believe that, uh, is this correct, uh, Congresswoman, that the grants are, I think, for like 75% of the cost of any given project. So the ports do have to bring some money to the project. Is that correct? Um, you know, I'm, I need to, to confirm to see what the ultimate bill um, had in it, because I know this was a back and forth. Um, but my my memory of it is that uh, that we didn't we didn't require that. Um, but you know, let me let me confirm to see what the final bill had in it, because um, I remember there being a, a percentage being talked about seventy percent. So uh, maybe maybe I think let me confirm because I and maybe by the time Jason is done, I'll have I'll have an answer um, because now that I'm talking about it, I'm thinking it was a seventy um, percent uh, for the federal government. Of putting in so um when you circle back with me i'll call. be you able to get a final that. i think I, I remember reading that so uh jason your final thoughts and then, and then congressman sure um so you know again i think environmentalists often are, are kind of accused of being against things right and what i really love about the blue economy is that it's an affirmative vision and so let's just take the ports one small slice you know fast forward 10 years and the congresswoman's bill is passed alta c is chugging along and what is the port? It's the most high tech, zero emissions, electric vehicles, um, amazing clean technology. The boats are slowed down with new fuels. The whales are not getting hit, they're surviving. We got Alta Sea with new aquaculture and robotics technology. We got a visitor center. We got huge new aquaculture for industrial chemicals, for foods. We have coastal restoration going around for the climate impacts. And now you can see a vision and you go, Take a look at, you know, and that took me 30 seconds, right? Isn't that vision better than what we have now? Why would we not want to invest in that vision, right? That's the way to go, right? And so I think environmentalists and the blue economy, we need to put forth this affirmative vision. And I think people are going to come around to realize that this is where, you know, this is where the government has a positive role in, in fostering this type of um, investment. In fact, didn't you, Jason, didn't you write some kind of ocean climate action plan? It sounds like you gave us a great summary of that right there. Yes, so, so we're working actually, and I'm sure the, the Congresswoman will be aware of this too, you know, we're working with the House and Senate on some larger ocean climate bills that we're hoping uh, will come to the Congress in, uh, in 2021. And, uh, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm sure we'll have a supporter in the Congresswoman and we are, you know, absolutely behind you know, all of her efforts. Well, that was a very exciting vision of the future that you painted there. It's hard to say anything but fantastic. Full we'll speed ahead on that. Okay, as we wind down here, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, Congresswoman, we're going to give you the final word here. Oh, well, thank you. And I was able to confirm that the federal government will provide up to 70% of the cost. And so it is a 70%. There's also a set aside of a minimum of 25% to fund areas that have not reached attainment, they call it non-attainment with the Clean Air Act, uh, criteria for pollution, which our area um, is a non-attainment. So that's uh, also, I think, will help direct dollars to areas like us that really need the funding. And so as, as we close here, I wanna just reiterate the importance of all to see for growing an emergent ocean economy centered around innovation is going to be critical for the sustainability of our coastal communities and our ports. You know, we face so many challenges in the 21st century, including how to feed the world as it warms, creating good paying jobs that cannot be exported uh, overseas, and addressing the climate crisis. So the work that Alta Sea is doing in these areas, including empowering the next generation of scientists to bring forward solutions that create jobs in our coastal communities, is so important. So working together, we can help elevate the Port of Los Angeles and our coastal communities as the global leader for these pressing issues and ensuring 
the world uh, that we pass on to our future leaders and future generations is sustainable and prosperous. And so I'm looking forward to getting Smart Sports Bill across the finish line, um, but also in partnering with them on new solutions that we can for the sustainable future. And I'm very excited about all the work Alta C is doing and the partnership that, that we have. So thank you all again. Well, thank you for giving us your time, your hard work and hanging in there. Uh, it's a tough, uh, a tough climate there in DC, but it's so wonderful to know that we have people like you who are really working for constructive change. Thank, thank you. you so very much. And I'd like to remind everybody that this has been recorded and you can go on the All to See website to share it with others or to, if you missed part of it, watch it, share it, whatever you like. And that there will be other All to See webinars coming up. Is that correct, Tim? That is correct, but don't ask me to tell you what they are and when. I didn't bring them. <laughs> it's all on the website. All to see it's website. all on the website. Pro go to altasee.org and click on Project Blue and you'll see all of our great stuff. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank the audience for your participation. Your questions were wonderful, imaginative, from all directions. We hope that we uh, answered most of them for you. Again, my name is Val Zavala, Tim McCosker. Thank you so much, Jason Spores and Congresswoman Nanette Diaz Baragon. Thank you. I said her name right. Thank you so much, and we'll see you at the next Altacy webinar. Take care. Thank you, Val. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. bye.